I'm here. So if you don't know, that was our worship night that we had on Wednesday. It was awesome. Uh, we had three churches come together. We had like around 300 people in the building for a worship night, which is pretty cool because, you know, that's like you get like extra Christian credit for going to a worship night. So actually, I do think you get partial credit, partial extra credit today because it's Super Bowl Sunday. And a lot of people like they skip, even though the game isn't for like five hours. They're like, we can't come to church today. There's, a, there's some, I'm doing something. So I'm sorry. If you're watching online right now, how you guys doing online, by the way? I wanted to, I wanted to check it. You in the room, you have to wait now. What's going on? My phone, like actually, I have an iPhone, like froze up on me five seconds ago. Must be getting to that point where they want me to upgrade, huh? <laughs> oh, here you guys are. Come on, Ben. Ben, are you here? We've got this guy named Ben. He watches from South Korea. It's pretty cool. Actually, hi, Aaron and Haley. How are you guys doing? Zach Phillips is at work. Nice. Getting paid to watch me. Dude, awesome. You're winning. You're winning. Uh, there he is, Ben. Yeah, I'm excited. Good to see you guys. All right, so the obligatory, um, some of you care, some of you don't. Who, who wants the Rams to win tonight? Get out. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> who, who wants it? <laughs> Are you just starting like an argument over here? I do. I really care. Uh, Cincinnati. Okay. Whatever. I know it's Ohio, technically. Uh, commercial slash halftime show. Anybody? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was supposed to be us, guys. It was supposed to be us. And when I say us, I mean Cleveland, by the way, just to clarify a few Steelers fans. It was supposed to be us this year. Always the bridesmaid, never the bride. That's fine. <laughs> All right. So uh, I want to start by giving, <laughs> telling you about a pet peeve I have. I have a list of pet peeves I have with Christians, and I'm sorry if I get, <laughs> I'm a pastor, so I, I, I am one, but I have this thing, I have a little bit of a chip on my shoulder sometimes with Christians. So one of the things I don't like, uh, like the way Christians view uh, or talk about it is comparison. I hate the way Christians talk about comparison. They act like comparison is the worst thing that you could do. You hear sermons, you know, they're called like the comparison trap or um, comparison is the thief of joy, stuff like that. And the gist behind it is that if you compare, you know, you're running the risk of uh, kind of making yourself miserable. And there's some truth to that, right? When you compare, if you compare your house to your neighbor's house or your fitness level to your friend's fitness level or your career to your college career, that can cause you to really be uh, discontent, maybe a little envious and stuff like that. So I get that, that there's like a danger in comparison. But I also know um, that comparison... Uh, well, I mean, for example, like comparison is the thief of joy, that little saying. That's not a Bible verse. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt said that, just so you know. And he seemed like a cool guy. I don't know much about him, but he's not Jesus. So he doesn't get to tell me how to live my life. Um, I typically don't let presidents tell me how to live my life. Anyways, that's a side note. Um, <laughs> more people clap for that than the other stuff I say. I do believe that comparison can teach us stuff. Uh, comparison is a way to learn, right? You compare what you do to the way someone successful does something. You can learn from that, right? Uh, now we have to guard against getting sucked into all the negative side about it, but that's, the, that's like the way I've learned like my whole life. I see somebody do something and I watch the way I do it and I try to close the gap between the two. Um, and for if you are a Christian, you know that we're supposed to live like Jesus, right? Like that's a big part of it. Even if you're not a Christian, you know that that's something Christians are supposed to do. We're supposed to follow Jesus, right? So how do you do that if you don't look at his life and look at your life and say, what's the difference between the two? We have to compare uh, his life and our life and try to, you know, close that gap. So um, I said all that to say that we're going to do some comparing today. And I wanted to introduce it because some of you would be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe we're doing that because we're in a church and we're not supposed to compare. Yes, you are. You're fine. Um, so we're going to look at a story. We are in a series um, looking at a guy named Jonah, right? Uh, so we left off last week. We only did three verses. It was crazy. We only did three verses, and we left off where Jonah was in a boat, right? He had just gotten into the boat. We're going to compare Jonah's experience in a boat with 
Jesus experienced in a boat, okay? So Jesus had a lot of different experiences in a boat, but the stories today are crazy similar. And I thought it'd be really cool to kind of do, you ever watch a movie where they're like following two scenes at once? We're just gonna kind of flip back and forth between the two movies and see how similar they are. And I think we learn a lot by putting them side by side. So to set the scene, uh, in both stories right now, we have uh, these these, uh, nautical crews taking off on a journey. Um, in Jonah's story, you have this, uh, an experienced crew heading off. Uh, Jonah is going to a city called Tarshish, right? He's supposed to go to Nineveh, but instead he's going to Tarshish. Nineveh would have been 500 miles this way. Instead, he's going 2,500 miles this way. He's trying to get 3,000 miles away from where God wants him. Crazy thing. But they're experienced and they're going this direction. And in this story, we have Jesus' disciples who are experienced fishermen. They are now embarking on a journey as well. So they're both casting off into the water on a trip. Uh, One crew lets Jonah on before they leave. The other crew lets Jesus on before they leave. Um, Side note, careful who you let under your boat. That's an important lesson there. Uh, Because these two trips, while they go similarly, one causes a storm, one stops the storm. Sorry, spoiler alert. Verse 4 in Jonah chapter 1. But... The Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. So Jonah is going in the opposite direction of the way God wants him, and uh, the Lord hurled a violent storm. So it sounds like God's got a good arm, right? He's throwing wind, and this violent storm starts over here. Now, flip scene over to Jesus in Mark 4.35. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out leaving the crowds behind, although their other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat and it began to fill with water. So we have some crazy similarities here, right? These stories are hundreds of years apart, but you have an experienced crew in each one setting off on a journey and both ships now are encountering storm, right? We got boats, we got bodies of water, we got breaking uh, waves and we've got big storms. So here's why I think it's important to look at these two stories together. If I just read Jonah's story, I'm tempted to say, if I encounter a storm in my life, it must mean I'm going in the wrong direction, right? That, that, that's the lesson in Jonah is that he's, he's going in the wrong direction and God sends a storm to turn him around and get him to go the right direction. So if you just read that story, you think, if I hit a storm, God must be trying to turn me around. But if you look over here in Mark, in Jesus' storm, well, <laughs> who, who told him to get in the boat? Jesus did. Who, who set the course? Jesus did. So I can't say, looking at this storm, that this storm is God trying to turn them around, right? I can't say that they're running from God in this storm. God's in the boat with them. So it can't be that, that this storm is meant to turn them around. So this is the first lesson as we compare these two stories. You have to interpret your storm. You have to interpret your storm. A storm does not automatically mean one thing or the other. Wouldn't it be nice if you had some things that happened in your life that automatically meant something spiritually? I would love if I knew that every time I encountered a storm, that meant God wanted me to change direction. I would love that, but that's not what it means. You have to interpret it. You have to look into these things. Jesus was not going in the wrong direction. Jonah was not going in the right direction. And they both encounter storms. So you have to interpret your storm. So let me give you a little bit of a, I don't know, like a rubric to look at your storm uh, that you may be in right now. One, uh, if you're doing something that the Bible clearly says not to do, or you're not doing something that the Bible clearly says to do, and you encounter a storm, specifically in that area of your life, I would say there's a good chance that that storm is designed to get your attention and, and to change your direction The source of the storm may well be God. So what I'm saying is use the Bible to interpret your storm. Now that's an interesting point because what that means is that the storm isn't actually telling you anything. And I think people want the storm to mean something. But listen, look at just, actually you just look at Jonah's story. Jonah did not need the storm to know that he was going in the wrong direction, right? He already knew that. 
God had told him, go that way, and he went this way. Jonah was not confused in his life. He was not like, hmm, which boat should I get on or which direction should I go? No, God said, dude, go that way. It was black and white. Go to this city, do this thing, say this thing. But he didn't. He went in the opposite direction. So the storm was not some compass in his life. He already knew he was going in the wrong direction. God used it to get his attention and, yes, to turn him around. So this is an important thing. What I'm saying is use the Bible as a compass in your life, not your storms and not your circumstances. That's really what I want you to do here. The storm um, might be God getting your attention, but odds are you already knew you were doing something God didn't want you doing. So if you're going in the wrong direction and you kind of already know it and you're hitting a storm, yep, that could be from God. And yep, he might be trying to get you to turn around. On the other hand, like if you're attempting in your life to like build God's kingdom and to share Jesus with people and to push back darkness and to like be obedient to God in your life in some area and you encounter a storm doing those things, well, then that storm is designed to distract you and deter you. And I believe the source of that storm would be Satan. He, he wants to get you off course. He wants to throw you off. You're trying to do what God wants you to do. You're trying to be obedient to God. And he is thrown in the wind and the waves because he wants to trip you up. He wants to slow you down. He wants to get you to change course. And then there's a third option. This one's kind of weird, but I don't know. Like, let me give you an example. Like, If you walk in late to work and you have a Dunkin' Donuts cup in your hand or a Starbucks, or whatever, and you get in trouble and your boss yells at you, don't say, oh, Satan sent in a storm after me today. No, 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 he didn't. He didn't do anything. The source of the storm is you. <laughs> it's your stupid choices. Um, so can, here, and here, I'm sorry, that's really harsh, man. You don't even know me. But listen, Christians have this tendency to spiritualize everything, right? Like either... <laughs> You know, it's God trying to get my attention to turn me around or it's Satan trying to stop me. You know what? There's a third option. It's not spiritual. It's not sinful. It's just a stupid choice that you made. And now you have the consequences of that choice. Sometimes it's just that. So um, I I hate to be practical. (laughs) It's not something preachers normally are, but um, sometimes it's just your choices. So I don't know, get up 30 minutes earlier or make your own coffee. Don't go, you know the Duncan line's going to be out to the road. Everybody complains about it all the time. Don't do that. Um, so you need to interpret your storm. You need to interpret your storm. All right, so both experience crews, both experiencing storms. Here's what happens next, verse 5 uh, in Jonah's story. Fearing for their lives, the desperate sailors shouted to their gods for help and threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. So in Jonah's story, you have these, these the crew in Jonah's story are not, uh, they don't have faith in Jonah's God. They have faith in all kinds of other gods. So their first instinct is they pray, and then they start jettisoning uh, their cargo. They want the ship to sit a little higher in the water. Flip over to Jesus' story in, in verse 38. The disciples shouting, teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? Now, that's not the whole verse, but I don't, we're going to get to the other part later. Uh, essentially, you have the disciples who are the ones in charge of the ship uh, freaking out, panicking. Yes, they wake Jesus up. Um, but look at what they say to Jesus. I mean, that is the right thing to do, by the way. If you ever find yourself in a boat and Jesus is sleeping, you hit a storm, you should wake him up. That is absolutely A plus, good, good job. But look at what they say to him. Like the way they talk to Jesus in that moment, don't you care that we're going to drown? Like it implies some things there. So um, I'm going to say that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paint the sailors in Jonah's story as actually doing the right thing. And I kind of want to say, besides waking Jesus up, that the disciples have like the wrong attitude and the wrong perspective. And the Jonah story is actually meant, uh, it's kind of a genius literary piece because everything in the story is upside down. I think I mentioned this last week. You have a prophet who doesn't want to speak, a man of God who wants to be far from God. We have these pagan sailors who actually respond the right way to a storm. It's actually kind of crazy. So everything in the story is kind of flipped upside down. These guys should have been the ones freaking out. Jonah should have been the one, hey, let's, let's do this right thing. And instead, uh, that's not the case. So these sailors, they pray and then they prepare. These ones over here, they panic and then they <laughs> panic. So I want to ask you, when a crisis hits your life, 
how do you respond? When a crisis hits your life, how do you respond? What's your instinct? You know what I mean? Not like the thing that happens before you catch yourself. What's your instinct when a crisis hits? Is it prayer or is it panic? Y'all know that there's a difference between, you give me five minutes, I can, I can respond the way a pastor should respond. But you catch me in that 30 seconds, I was telling first service that I was like getting a little heated in our YMCA basketball game the other day with, with 10 year olds. And I was like, I literally walked off the court to uh, Jake, his son's on our team, or his 15 kids are on our team. And um, I was like, I know I'm not supposed to like punch a 12 year old. <laughs> but I kind of want to punch a 12 year old. But that was my instinct. I caught myself. I didn't. I did squeeze his hand a little bit when he went to shake it. Um, That's as far as it went. (laughs) But what's your your instinct? Like for me, your instinct tells you a lot about what's going on in here. And honestly, I had to pray about that because I was like, I kind of do want to fight the 12 year old. So I'm like, Lord, what's going on in here? But when you hit a crisis, do do you instinctively go to prayer or do you instinctively go to panic? What's the first thing that pops out of you? Because that means something. That tells you something. And listen, if you're a Christian, this is a huge deal. This is a huge deal. How you respond when a crisis hits in your life is a huge deal. Because how you respond to a crisis is a huge part of your witness to the world. Of your witness to the world. Think about that. All the stuff you say about God, all these stances that you have, all these principles that you live by, you can say all the right things, but if you hit a crisis and you go to panic, what do you think the people in your life believe about you? Do they, do they believe all the principles and all the lofty words, or do they believe where you go when something gets tough? I'm telling you... This is a huge deal. How you respond in crisis is a huge part of your witness to the world. Because Paul tells us in Philippians, right, that if we pray in a crisis, we we have access to the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, right? So it doesn't even make sense how much peace you're supposed to have as a Christian. If you pray, you have access to that peace. So when you're in a crisis and you're praying and you have that peace, people are going to look at you and go, how are you not falling apart right now? How are you still here? How are you not freaking all the way out right now? And that gives you the opportunity to tell them about the source of the peace that you have. But if you freak out, being a person who has faith in a God who loves you and cares about you and has all the resources at his disposal, what do you think people are going to think about that God or what you or the faith you claim to have in him. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. So how do you respond? What is your instinct in a crisis? Um, and then the other thing I like about the, the sailors in Jonah's story is that they pray and they prepare. Did you notice that? That they, they prayed, admittedly, to the wrong God, but whatever. Um, and then they start throwing cargo over. They do something. And this is another thing Christians do, man. And I, I, it's like a, one of, another one of my pet peeves. I'm sorry being hard on Christians today. Um, but they have it's what I call like the carry under with theology, like the Jesus take the wheel theology, right? Where you just kind of pray and then you just sit there like, all right, Lord, I prayed. So now what are you going to do? But like, that's never, oh, almost never in the Bible is that the thing. Like he always wants us to pray and do something. So they pray and they're throwing stuff out of the ship. They're doing something about it. So um, it's an old saying, pray like it all depends on God, work like it all depends on you. Both of those things together are how the Christian is supposed to live. Uh, so I really like that these guys, again, they're somehow they're, they're getting it right over here while the disciples are freaking out over here. All right, so the stories continue. And again, the fact that they are so parallel is crazy. Verse five in the Jonah story. But all this time, Jonah was sound asleep in the hold. So the captain went down to him. How can you sleep at a time like this? He shouted, get up and pray to your God. Maybe he will pay attention to us and spare our lives. So Jonah's asleep in a storm. It doesn't make a ton of sense. Flip over to Jesus' story. Verse 38, Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. Both storms, both of our protagonists, I suppose, are asleep in the boat. Little side note on this Jesus verse with the head on the cushion. I have to tell you this. I can't like not tell you because it's just such a cool thing. Um, 
in the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. It's such a weird detail to include. Um, so biblical scholars um, have noted that at the time of the writing of the Bible, when they wrote fiction, uh, they would not include details that didn't like move the story along. They would never, that's not the way they wrote fiction back then. If there was a detail in a fiction story, it always had something to do, you know, always move the story along. A detail like this, um, so we believe that Mark wrote the book of Mark, but he wrote it off of Peter's eyewitness account. So what, what we believe happened is Peter is like pacing in a living room somewhere talking about this storm. And he's like, yeah, and Jesus was asleep. And, you know, he was with his head on the stupid cushion in the back of the boat. And, then, you know, and, and like, it was a detail because he was remembering what had happened. There's no other reason to put in here that Jesus had a cushion that he had his pillow on than if somebody was remembering it. Just a little cool side note kind of helps me uh, with the validity and truth of the Bible. Uh, so anyways, both are asleep. Now, here's the interesting thing though. There's two storms, two boats, two people sleeping, but the reason they're sleeping could not be further apart. Their, their motive and their attitude behind sleeping are polar opposites. Jesus is asleep because he has absolute power and absolute hope, right? Jonah? Jonah is asleep because he has no power and no hope. So while they look the same on the outside, their internal uh, workings, the, the thing that led them to that sleep, are very different. Now, this is one of those things where it's hard to be like, be like Jesus. Well, Jesus could literally tell a thunderstorm to shut up. So maybe you need to get up and bail water. You know what I'm saying? Like you can't like just say like do exactly what Jesus does here. Because if you could tell the thunderstorm to shut up, good. But you can't do that. So it's kind of hard for me to say in this instance, be like Jesus, not like Jonah. Um, and we'll talk about that more here in a minute. But I want to look at Jonah's sleep. Why is he sleeping in a storm that could kill him? I mean, would kill him something doesn't happen, right? How could you sleep during that? So some of you, maybe you're familiar with this. Maybe you've been there, maybe you are there. Like life can take you to some pretty dark places, right? Some of you know exactly what it's like to just want to sleep. Like that's it, that's all you want to do. Um, and the reason you want to sleep is because there's nothing for you when you're awake. You got nothing. So you'd rather just sleep. And, and Jonah, this is, such, this is an, uh, an apathetic nap. He, he does not care what happens while he's sleeping. He just wants to sleep. So there's a word for this. Uh, it's called despair. Despair. And I want to make a, a distinction between despair and and depression, because they're not the same thing. Depression, uh, obviously, I mean, you can get down. That can be a chemical imbalance in your brain. I know some, some of you have that. And then you know, depression can just come from a series of punches in the face, right? Your, your circumstances just keep hitting you, and it can kind of take you to uh, a dark place. But depression is one thing. Despair, you kind of cross a line. Um, and the definition of despair is a complete loss of hope a complete loss of hope. That's different than depression, okay? Because you, if, you, if you go to a complete loss of hope, that is the darkest of dark. So I'm not talking about, hey, man, if you're depressed, you need, you need Jesus, you need to work through that, you need therapy, you need, I was going to say drugs, it's maybe <laughs> uh, prescription drugs, let me be specific. Um, you need to work through that. But despair, man, if you're a Christian, despair is a place you cannot go. Because, um, I mean, think about it. Like the God we believe in, the God we believe in is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present. Despair is kind of incompatible with a faith in a God like that, isn't it? If we really believe that God is all-powerful, if we really believe that he's all-knowing, if we really believe he's everywhere all the time, does despair make sense? with a faith in a God like that? Now, I'm not saying that you won't be tempted to go to that kind of a place. 
being tempted to go to that place is different than actually going there, right? The best Christians in the Bible, almost all of them were tempted to go to the place where I've got nothing. Um, But being tempted to go there and going there are two different things. So David, David's one of the... um, well, one of the best people of faith in the Bible. He had a couple of hiccups here and there, but um, he is a man of God. He, he works hard at his relationship with God, but David struggled with this. Look what David says in Psalm 42, 5. Why are you in despair, my soul? Why are you restless within me? Wait for God, for I will again praise him for the help of his presence, my God. So David, he's down, he's definitely down, and he sees his soul starting to slip into this place of no hope. And look at what he does. He talks to his soul. He talks to his soul. He has a conversation. It's not a monologue in here. It's a dialogue. He's actually speaking to his soul saying, hey, what are you doing? I see that you're heading in this direction. Stop it. You don't, you don't belong over there. And I love that. I think this is an important thing, especially, man, I think so often, especially in our weird day and age that we live in, we act like feelings are king. And like, if I feel this way, it's real, it's valid, it's all these things. And, and, and sure, okay. But I also think you can, you can mentally fight back and not go to those places. And that's what David's doing here. He's saying, yeah, okay, I understand that I'm tempted to feel this way, but no, that doesn't make sense. That's not consistent with my reality as a person of faith. For me to say I have no hope at all does not make sense. I believe in an all-powerful God, and an all-knowing God, a God who loves me, and I'm still alive. That means I don't have no hope. That's one of the things we say here all the time. If, if you're not dead, God's not done. There is something that God wants to do in your life, even in the darkest of places. Matter of fact, my guess is he lets you get to the dark places. He's going to use that dark place to help somebody else out of their dark place. There's going to be purpose even in the darkest. You got to fight back. You got to mentally fight back against the temptation to go to despair. We are never without hope. So I hope you never have a sleep like Jonah's, the sleep of despair. Now, they're both sleeping. Uh, They both get woke up. This is what happens next. We're going to look at Jesus' story first and then Jonah's in this instance. Verse 39 in Jesus' story. Uh, When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the wave, silence, be still. Suddenly, the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Then he turns on the disciples, asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. Man, there's so much in just those couple of verses. So one, dude gets up, (laughs) tells a thunderstorm to shut up. You're interrupting my REM cycle, right? (laughs) I mean, just like an inconvenience to my nap here. And then he wheels on the disciples. I mean, the fact that he has that kind of authority, and then he's just like, and what's up with you guys? Why were you afraid? This is one of those times in the Bible, again, where I look at it and I go, wow, like that. That's. I want to say harsh, right? You're in a life-threatening storm and Jesus' response is, don't you trust me? Like, don't you, don't you know who I am? Don't you know what I can do? Like, that's putting the bar pretty high. And then the response, this is again the, the way these things are written. It's this literary genius because they were terrified of the storm and then it, they're terrified of the calm because of the source of the calm, is in the boat with them, and they realize the power they would have took to tell the thunderstorm to shut up is now sitting on a cushion in the back of the boat, and they're like, oh my, they're terrified of that as well. Now, that's the Jesus story. Jesus calms the storm. Jonah has a little different tactic. So over here in verse 12, here's Jonah's solution. Throw me into the sea. He said, and I will, and it will become calm again. I know that this terrible storm is all my fault. Instead, the sailors rowed even harder to get the ship to land, but the stormy sea was too violent for them, and they couldn't make it. So Jonah's like, it's me, guys. I'm the source. I'm the problem. You get rid of me. You get rid of the storm. That's the way it's going to work. And the, the, the sailors are such good guys that they're like, we don't want to do that. So they try to row back to, to, to land, uh, but the storm will not let them get back to land. Verse 14, then they cried out to the Lord, to Jonah's God. Now they're praying to Jonah's God. 
Oh Lord, they pleaded, don't make us die for this man's sin. And don't hold us responsible for his death. Oh Lord, you have sent this storm upon him for your own good reasons. Then the sailors picked Jonah up, threw him into the raging sea, and the storm stopped at once. The sailors were awestruck by the Lord's great power and offered him a sacrifice and vowed to serve him. So again, the, the parallel, I just love the parallels between these two stories. Jonah's like, it's me, guys. You got you to get rid of me. They don't want to. And then they pray this profound prayer. And they toss him into the sea. And the same kind of thing happens. They were afraid of the storm and then they were afraid of the calm because they knew that the source of the calm must have been more powerful than the source of the storm. And they kind of have that holy moment where they're like, whoa. Now they, they prayed something here. That's crazy that they prayed it hundreds of years before Jesus came to earth. Don't make us die for this man's sin. I love that. You know, Bible scholars will tell you that the entire Bible is about Jesus. The entire thing. Even the Old Testament, which seems, a lot of it seems to have nothing to do with Jesus. They say that it has these, these shadows, these ripples, these echoes of what is to come. It's called foreshadowing. And this, don't make us die for this man's sin. What a prayer. A little gospel nugget buried in the Old Testament. Can't you just see the scene in heaven? They're praying, right? God hears our prayers. So don't you just hear this prayer come up to heaven? Don't make us die for this man's sin. And you, and here's Jesus here in that prayer. I can just imagine Jesus kind of standing up all heaven listening, saying, hold up, hold up, hold up. They're not going to die for that man's sin. I am. I'm going to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to take his place. They, they don't have to die for it. I'm going to take his sin onto me. That the, the, even the Old Testament ripples with these little uh, waves of the gospel. And by the way, that's the biggest contrast between these two stories. Um, Jonah is trying to run away from telling people about a God that loves them. Jesus, on the other hand, this is the part I didn't tell you about unless you're a Bible scholar, you probably didn't realize this. Do you know where Jesus was going? It's a crazy thing. It's a crazy thing. Because remember, Jesus told them to get in the boat, right? This wasn't Peter's idea. This wasn't the disciples' idea. They weren't going fishing. Jesus said, we're getting in the boat. Jesus is the one that said, we're going across the lake. Specifically to a town called Gadara. Which they, archaeologists don't even know where this was. It's, it's that insignificant. You know what Jesus does there? And you would think this is like, if, if I, I'm just going to say, he, he gets up specifically makes a special trip. He's going to go all the way across the lake. He's going to get in a fist fight with a thunderstorm. What's he going to do? Seems like a big thing. He gets over there and he heals one guy, just one. And then he comes back. It's crazy. But I want to look at the story. You might be familiar with the story once I start reading it. It's in Mark chapter 5. Verse two, when Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came up from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the burial caves and could no longer be restrained even with a chain. So this man's got, he's got some evil things going on inside of him. And he runs up on Jesus. Verse four, whenever he was put into chains and shackles as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrist and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him, no one. Day and night, he wandered among the burial caves and hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. Man, so like, whatever the evil is inside of this guy was so powerful that nobody could do anything about it. Nobody could subdue him. Jesus walks off the boat and this guy runs up on him. I mean, I, don't you just wonder the scene like Peter was always skittish. He's like looking for an oar to hit him with or something, right? It's gonna like, what's gonna happen? Now, there's a whole bunch of details in the story, but Jesus basically speaks to the evil inside of this man and says, go. And it has to go. The man's healed completely in that moment. But um, that little part about the guy being stuck in this, this burial, I mean, he lives in a cemetery and he's cutting himself and he's, he's tortured. And it says that he 
wandered around the hills howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. Like this horrible, like torture that this man endured. Now, you know, in the gospels, if you've ever read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you know how often Jesus went away to like a quiet place to pray? It's pretty consistent, right? If you read in those stories, Jesus went away to pray, Jesus went away to pray. Early in the morning, late at night, Jesus was always kind of getting away by himself into a quiet place and praying. I wonder if he didn't go up on a hill somewhere that kind of overlooked the lake and he wasn't having his moments with God and if the wind came just right, he didn't hear that howling from that man. He didn't hear that pain from that man come across the lake, just a whisper. And if at some point Jesus didn't just decide, you know what, I'm gonna do something about this. I'm done with this. I'm gonna make a special trip. I'm gonna get in a boat. And, and uh, the, the thunderstorm, this, this thing, cause man, Satan didn't wanna let this guy go. He was gonna try and prevent Jesus from getting to this guy. And Jesus like, get out of my face, Satan. You can't stop me. Jesus walks up onto that shore and heals the guy instantly. I wonder if, like, that's where you're at. You feel like that man who's, who's, you've got an internal struggle, you've got an internal pain, you've got a howling on the inside. Man, I just want you to know that Jesus coming for you. We have a a relentless God who loves you and wants to heal you and have you live a life of purpose and passion, not one that's just constantly filled with pain. And I'm not saying your life's gonna be perfect, but I do believe that he wants to step into that and I believe he has all authority. I believe Jesus can speak into your soul and quiet it. I believe he loves you enough to do it. And I actually, it's weird. Maybe it's just like a pastor thing. I believe the evidence that God wants to do something in your life is the fact that you're sitting here in a church. I know that's weird. Maybe you're like, no, the reason I'm sitting here is because my wife may become. Okay, fine. (laughs) Then God is using your wife. I'll give her that weapon against you later. Pastor said, God speaks through me. But I believe God brought you here for the, because he wants you to know that he loves you and he wants to work in your life and he wants to heal that wound. He's pursuing you. Jesus did all that for one guy. So you need to hear that. In Jesus' name, there is healing, there is peace. Now, some of you already know that. I want to finish the story. Verse, starting in verse 18, look at what happens. As Jesus was getting into the boat, because he's done here, because he healed one guy, the man who had been deemed as this begged to go with him. But Jesus said, no, he didn't let him follow him. But listen to why. Go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. So the man started off to visit the 10 towns of that region, began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at what he told them. So Jesus, I mean, guys, that's, prof- that's huge. If you're reading your Bible like, Jesus was the guy who would walk up to people and say, follow me. This guy runs up to Jesus and says, let me follow you. And Jesus says, no, dude, you got something else you're supposed to do. Now that's crazy because his mission was, Jesus, remember, Jesus went over onto this side of the lake just one time, healed one guy and he went back, but he left the guy there. He left him there, planting a little explosive behind enemy lines here because Jesus knew that this guy was not gonna stay quiet about what God had done in his life. He was gonna go out and he was gonna tell everybody about what God had done. And that the fame of Jesus' name and the, the, the faith would spread out on that side of the lake because of what God did in his life. There's a responsibility when God does something in your life that he wants to do something through you, right? It's one of the things we talk about here often. God wants to do some things for you, some things in you, and then he wants to do some things through you. People in your life who are far from God, but close to you. He wants to use you to draw them to him. He wants to use a little conversation here, a little attitude there, a little text message here to draw people to him through you. 
This man got it. He had a passion for it. And uh, we, as a church, have a passion for it. And I want to continue to invite you into that. That God has done some amazing things in your life. And he wants to use you to reach people that are in your life. And he puts you there for a reason. Puts you there for a reason. Worship team, why don't you guys come up here? It's one of the things we're praying for this year is that person. That person in your life who's far from God but close to you, that God would give you the opportunity to have that conversation. Don't stop praying for it just because the fast is over. Keep, keep that going. Pray with me. Jesus, pray for the person who's in a, in a storm right now. I pray that you give them wisdom to find out what, it, what the reason is. Usually the answer is just going to be... <laughs> to get close to you. And I pray that they would have the, the energy and the draw to draw close to you in that. I pray for the person who's just hurting right now, Lord. Maybe they're in a dark place. Maybe they know what that sleep that Jonah slept is like. I pray that you would shine your light into that. That they would see you for who you are, that you are all powerful and all loving and you want to move in their life. They would be drawn into that and drawn out of that dark place, Lord. I pray that we would, as Christians, catch <laughs> that fire that that man had, that passion to share what Jesus has done with as many people as possible. Lord, I want that. I want that to be contagious in this place build your kingdom, fulfill your mission. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.